I am Gonzalo Juebet. I'm the curator of invertebrate zoology at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University, and I am also a professor in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology. Mollusks are the uh, second largest group of animals after the arthropods, and there's about 200,000 living species. As you can see, these rooms are full of cabinets, and each one of these cabinets has many, many, many drawers all with different shells from different mollusks. That diversity, not only in shell morphology, but also in their body, is reflected in the enormous geologic history that they have. I first uh, became interested in mollusks when I was about five or six years old, and it was to a neighbor who had a, a mollusk collection, a shell collection. And then I started collecting uh, shells when I was about six. Uh, beach combing in my hometown of Villanova, south of Barcelona in Spain. And I had been collecting mollusks since then, until last year, when I donated my private collection to the Museum of Comparative Zoology at uh, Harbor. There's a lot of questions that one can answer by studying mollusks. And they also have a lot of importance to humans as protein source, as monitors for pollution, and also because they have such a great fossil record, they have been used to monitor climate change or evolution of ecosystems. So it is definitely a great group to study all sorts of questions from ecology to evolution to climate change. This is uh, my laboratory. Here we work on mollusks and other groups of animals, and some of the people working on the projects of mollusks are Sonia, who's a postdoc from Brazil, Giselle is another postdoc from Brazil, Erin is a technician generating a lot of DNA sequences for the Bivalve project, and here, hiding in the computer, we have Vanessa, who's a graduate student working on a group of bivalves called Archaeheterodonts. We have many questions about mollusks, but some of the most interesting ones we're dealing with nowadays are the relationships among the eight mollusk classes. And we can extract DNA and use the PCR machines to amplify target genes. Or now we're using other techniques called next generation sequencing. We can use hundreds or thousands of genes to infer the same phylogenetic relationships. And therefore, the results are much more robust. One of the things that is most surprising to us is about the relationships of a group of mollusks. It's called a living fossil, the monoplacophorans. They were thought to have gone extinct more than 300 million years ago. Here's an example, a blown up model of an animal that is much smaller than an inch. So monoplacophorans resemble modern limpets. We were able to generate the first molecular data and one of the discoveries that we have made uh, most recently is that they might actually be related to the cephalopods, to the squids and octopuses and the chamber nautilus. Cephalopods are very fascinating because the most primitive cephalopods had an external shell like we find nowadays in gastropods. And here's an example of one of these chamber nautilus. It was a very abundant group of cephalopods in the Ordovician seas. Then cephalopods lost their shell progressively, first by internalizing into a large calcium carbonate structure in the cuttlefish, like these examples that we have here. So these have a large internal shell. And then that large internal shell became a very thin, transparent shell in groups like squid. The pinnacle of evolution of cephalopods are octopuses, this very smart marine animal that we all know, that they have completely lost the shell. And that's what gives them the flexibility to, for example, being able to go inside and outside of a small bottle. And, and we actually found a, a surprising result with their relationship with these monoplacophorans, that actually monoplacophorans and cephalopods are closely related. Uh, and they are Cambrian monoplacophorans that had chamber shells, the same as the shells that we find in the chamber nautilus. And that's one of the uh, explanations for the relationship of those two groups. This is something that people don't realize, but 
scientists have been arguing about these things for decades and decades and still no one is confident about how these things are related to each other. I think that all these new molecular data are going to really help us. Harvard and the Museum of Comparative Zoology are excellent places to conduct this type of research because we combine the traditional specimens, large collections, and the specimen work from the museum and the very modern research labs where we can generate genomic level data for these organisms. Very few places in the world can combine both the tradition and the modern in a fashion like we can do here at Harvard University.